Well, good morning, Freedom Church. How you doing this morning? Amen. Amen. Hey, my name is Pastor Chad. I get to serve as the care pastor here at Freedom Church. And I just want to say thank you for taking the opportunity to be here with us in worship today at Freedom Church. Uh, just get, man, this is the last Sunday of the year. Amen. How many of you guys are ready for some Titans football this afternoon? Yeah, a few of us, a few of us. Yep, how many of you are expecting God to do something amazing in your life in 2019? You're like, man, I'm, I'm anticipating something, something great. Amen? Yes. Hey, I want to take just a moment, and uh, I just want to honor our pastor, uh, Pastor T uh, and his wife. I am so honored to have them as, our, as, as my pastor. He's been my pastor for about 13 years now. Uh, I've never met someone that is so uh, just excited about the Lord and so excited about reaching people and so excited about reaching his community. As a matter of fact, he preached 17 different, 17 different times last week over an eight-day eight period, uh, eight day period. And, uh, man, he is just uh, excited about reaching people. So let's give God some praise for our pastor. Amen. If you want to, you can stand to your feet and give God some praise for our amazing pastor who leads our church, who encourages us, who lifts up the name of the Lord, who shows us how that we can be people of God, how that he has given us messages, ha- messages, how he prays for us, how he lifts up the name of the Lord, and how he leads us to be the same. So uh, just thank you, Pastor T, if you're watching. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Shanda, uh, for your love for people and for your love for Freedom Church. So honored to be able to serve alongside him. Um, so we're, we've been in this series called The Scandal, and we've talked about some, Pastor T has taught us several different things. He's taught us about the prophecy of Jesus before Jesus was ever born. He's taught us about the, uh, the genealogy of Jesus, which was in the book of Matthew, the very first uh, book of Matthew. And, and he taught us, you know, how a lot of times we skip over the genealogy of Jesus, but he helped us to understand some things that, that took place and how that God's grace was revealed through the genealogy of Jesus. And it was just really encouraging message for me. And last week, we celebrated the birth of Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Like, it was so cool to see so many people on our campus, and we had uh, people's lives who were being changed, and people making decisions for Christ. And also, something that I'll never forget, I've never been that close to a camel. Have you, have you guys ever been that close to a camel? That was the coolest thing, was to be able to feed a camel, and watch my kids feed a camel, and just to have that, that whole experience. It was just a, just a lot of fun. And uh, we, I believe that it was a blessing to our community. So, we're, And today, uh, I'm going to wrap up the Scandal series. I have the honor and privilege of sharing God's word with you today. And I'm going to wrap up the, mess, the, the Scandal series. And I'm, my, the title of my message today is The Aftermath. And you, you can see that on, your, on the back of your worship guide. As a matter of fact, normally we have uh, some things that you can write down and follow along with. On your worship guide today, you have notes. So if you feel God speak to you, if you feel God impress something on your heart, feel free to take that ink pen that we provide for you in the back of your seat and make any notes that you feel that the Lord leads you to write down. I have some points and I have some scripture. If you do not have your Bible, uh, you can just follow right along on the, on the side screens. If you do have your Bible, awesome. Give yourself a pat on the back for bringing your Bible today, the last Sunday of the year. You're, most, you're more spiritual than everybody else this year, right? So uh, just kidding. Uh, so if you, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to those. Uh, we'll be there in just a moment, but we will be in the book of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. So the aftermath, uh, and, and what I was really thinking about a whole lot is when after, after Christmas, uh, on Christmas morning, I don't know how it is at your house, but when I uh, wake up in the morning, used to, I would wake up before my kids woke up, and I would wait on them to, to, to get up. But now I sleep in a little bit because they're getting older. But one thing that happens on Christmas morning is there is gifts everywhere, right? And they, they walk in, they're like, you know, Santa's came, and we're all excited and pumped, and we're celebrating that, you know, that we're, we're celebrating, you know, those, the gifts and those kinds of things, and we're, we're ripping open gifts, and we're tearing paper and shredding paper everywhere, and, and we're opening up cards, and we've got, you know, some of us have, we're getting gift cards and money and all these receipts, you know, all this stuff's going on, and man, after all the gifts are open, it takes about 15 minutes, doesn't it? 15 minutes and everything is destroyed. The, the, the living room floor is full of wrapping paper and boxes and torn uh, tape and, and, you know, all kinds, of, all kinds of stuff. And you look around and, you, and you're like, man, that was fun. And, and then the kids are like, 
they take a minute and then they go back to see what they actually got after they've destroyed everything and you spent two or three months shopping for them, right? But what I was reminded of is after the gifts have been opened, there's an aftermath, isn't there? There's an aftermath of trash and and debris, and paper, and boxes, and, and, and you have to pick all that stuff up, and you have to, you know, either go and burn it, or you have to put it in a trash bag and get rid of it, uh, but either way, there's always an aftermath of trash, there's always an aftermath of boxes and debris, and sometimes our lives can look the very same way, especially at this time of year, when we're wrapping up a, when we're wrapping up a year, 2018, we're wrapping up 2018, and we're getting ready to start a brand new year in just a couple of days, and this is a really good time for us to reflect on what happened in 2018, but also uh, make goals and, and, and say, man, I want to make some different choices and different decisions in 2019. And, and so what we do is we begin to reflect and we say, man, there is a lot, there's some things in my life, there's some choices that I make, there's some things that happened to me in 2018 that I'm praying to God they are not the same way that they were, that, that, that 2019 is different. So you may have been, you, you may have made some choices, you may have made some decisions in 2018 that, that have caused you to be in a place in your life that you don't want to be right now. You, 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 there might be some, uh, you may have made the decision to eat too many sweets over Christmas break and now you can't fit into your new jeans, right? And you're like, I'm going to make a choice to lose some, some LBs over, the, over the, you know, the, the new year. Or choices, choices that you have made, you say, you know, I was, I was getting crazy and I really was feeling led by myself to go and buy all these gifts. And I've used my credit card way too much. And you're, you're knowing, you're anticipating that the bills are about to start coming. Like the aftermath is about to happen. The bills are start, about to start rolling in. You're already getting anxious and worked up about that stuff. Or maybe you worked way too much this past year. You, you, you were, man, you were a workaholic. You were really driven and you were really trying to make up some, you were trying to make up some time and make up some, some past payments and those kinds of things. And you spent way too much time away from home. And you missed out on a lot of your, li your kids' lives. And you missed out on some very important dates and things that happened just because you were so driven that you were trying to make up some, some, some lost time. So maybe you work too much. You, you want to change that. Maybe you and your spouse can't seem to see eye to eye. Like 2018, man, you guys were just like button heads the whole time. And you're, you're like, man, I, I made some choices in 2018 that I don't want to make in 2019. And, and, and so you're, you're living with that aftermath because of some choices that you and your spouse have made. Maybe you have a child that you cannot get to come to church. You have prayed for them. You have begged them. You have, you have, you have offered to buy them lunch and dinner after church, and you have, you have done everything that you can possibly do. You've sent them scripture through text message, and you've, you've tried to inspire them, encourage them, and you cannot seem to get them to come to church. And you are living with that aftermath that, that, that you didn't bring them up in church, and you didn't teach them about the Word of God, and you didn't teach them about who Jesus was when they were little. So you're saying, man, you're, you're trying to carry that aftermath. You're trying to carry that weight that, man... I've made some bad choices raising my kids, and in 2019, I want those to be different. Maybe you've just been too busy. We can get too busy, can't we? You know, I feel like that the enemy uses us being too busy as a distraction to keep us from being who God wanted us to be. Maybe you've just been way too busy this year. And instead of you being in control of your calendar, your calendar has been in control of you. Your calendar has been dictating what you do, where you go, who you spend time with, what appointments you have, what, uh, what office visit, all those, how you run your business. You, you have been allowing your calendar to dictate who you are. Regardless of where you're at in the aftermath, sometimes we have people that have made choices that, re that, that and we're living in that aftermath of somebody else's choice. Maybe you didn't make a choice in 2018 that, have you, that has you in a place that you don't want to be. Maybe it was somebody else that made a choice. Maybe it was your husband or your wife that, that decided not to, that they didn't want to be married to you anymore. And they just walked out on you. And now you're, you're stuck at home by yourself. You don't have your spouse with you. And this was the first Christmas that you lived and that you had with, with your spouse not being there to celebrate it with you. Maybe uh, your boss made a decision this, this year, just recently, and you're, you're, you're without a job. He, he decided that he didn't need you or they, they didn't need you to be a part of their business anymore or they didn't need you as an employee. And now you're stuck without a job. 
and you spent all your life building this career, and now here you are, you don't have a job anymore. Or maybe uh, you have a partner in business. Man, you had, a, you had a partner in business. You had this dream that you were, you were walking toward, that you were wanting to, to make happen, and you were, trying to, you were trying everything that you could, and, and now all of a sudden your, your business partner says, you know what, this is taking too much time, taking too much energy, and I'm not in it anymore. And, you're, and you're now, now your dreams are crushed and you're falling apart. So, so, we, so as we get ready to bring 2019 in, as we get ready to celebrate a brand new year, you know, those are some things that we, and some of you may be dealing with other things. I don't know, you may have lost a loved one in 2018, and man, you're, you're dealing with the grief of that. But wherever we are, sometimes this is a really good time for us to begin uh, and, and, to be, and to make some new choices, to make some, some, some new decisions. Maybe you, this, 2018 was the best year of your life, and you're like, man, I'm just going to tweak 2019 a little bit and, and, and just continue to build on that. Man, if that's you, that's awesome. I'm celebrating that with you. So as we get ready to walk into a new year, as we get ready to, to, to build some, to start some new routines, you may be in a routine right now. You may be in a routine and you're trying to continue to build on something that you feel like that you cannot change. You're trying to build on something that you feel like that you cannot change. And I want you to know that you are not a failure because of your routine. You're not a failure because of your routine that happened in 2018 or all the way up until now. And I want you to know something, that Every single one of us have a choice that we can make to change our routine, don't we? And I believe that there are some people that are here today under the sound of my voice, including myself, that, I, that we need to make some choices. We need to, we need to, change, we need to change some things. We need, we need to make some different choices and change our routine in 2019 in order to be who God, is, who God wants us to be and, and to be able to reach our goals and do what God wants us to do. Amen? So I want you to do right now, I just want you to turn to your neighbor and say, and touch about five people around you and say, man, I'm changing, I'm changing my routine in 2019. I'm changing my routine. I'm changing my routine. I'm changing my routine. I'm changing my routine. So after the birth of Jesus, um, after the birth of Jesus, something that was, requ that was required by the Jewish law was if there was a child that was born, uh, and he was a male child, the, the, male, the very first ch male child of a family had to be dedicated to the Lord. So last week we talked about how that Jesus was born, and this, year, this week we're going to talk about what, happens after, what happened after Jesus was born. So um, as, they were, as, as Mary and Joseph were going to the temple to dedicate uh, Jesus to the Lord, uh, there's some things that had to happen, that had to take place, that was part of the Jewish culture, that was part of the Jewish law. And one thing that they had to do is they had to, they had to go and dedicate him. Uh, so they had to bring him to uh, the temple, and it was eight days later. It had to be eight days later. And what they would do in that time is that, was, that is when they would, they would give the baby a name. How many of you have waited eight days before you gave your child a name? I think we name them before they come out of the womb now, right? So, so... <laughs> So anyway, you had this, this, this baby that hadn't even received his name yet, but we know that his name was, had already been prophesied about, right? We already knew what his name was going to be, but they had to wait until the eighth day to present and to give the baby the name. And his name was uh, in Hebrew, and I think Pastor T even shared this during the genealogy, but his name uh, in Hebrew was pronounced Yeshua. And Yeshua it actually means to, to deliver or to set free. Isn't that awesome? Our Savior has the name that means to deliver or to set free. That's just, like we could just end our service right now. That is everything that I want to, that I want to, to get to you today. Is that I want you to get that one thing, that Jesus' name means to set free or to deliver. And the other thing that had to happen was circumcision. Uh, circumcision had to happen on the eighth day, and this is a sim symbolic covenant to the, uh, to, to the people of Abraham and the, and the, and the, and the Israelites. And the, so they had to perform a circumcision on the eighth day, and that, that, was, a, that was a covenant uh, or a representation of the covenant that the Lord had made with Abraham that he would always be with him and that he would multiply his people. So, and the other thing that had to happen was there was a sacrifice that had to be made. Uh, and in the Bible, if you'll read in Luke, in Luke chapter 2, uh, the, the sacrifice that had to be made was either two pigeons or two turtle doves. And what's really cool about th that symbolism is uh, if you were rich, then you brought something besides two doves or two pigeons. You would bring like a lamb or a goat. But it was really cool to me to know that, to know that God uses poor people too. 
Isn't that good? Like God uses poor people too. It doesn't just have to be the rich and the and the famous and the people who have it all together and who are you know who are standing on platforms. And it, God uses everybody. So it was really awesome to me to see that that God uses poor people too, and, and that He would would accept their two pigeons or two turtle doves. And what that done is that was a representation that they were purchasing Jesus back from because because He had to be dedicated to the Lord, right? So the, the sacrifice that was made was a price of redemption. So that was showing that they had dedicated Jesus to the Lord. And that's what we're going to pick up in Luke 2, chapter 25. It says, at that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. And as a matter of fact, I've been pronouncing his name wrong all week. Like, I've been, I've been saying Simon, and I was back there with Wes, and he was like, Simeon. I was like, Simeon. I was like, man, I've been saying Simon all week. <laughs> so I've been reading. So anyway, this funny story. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel and had revealed to him, uh, and had revealed to him uh, that he would not die until he had, been the Lord's, uh, until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Sorry. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby, uh, baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as, your, as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God. To the nations, and he is the glory of your Lord, uh, he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was, what was being said about him. Then Simon blessed them and said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, God, we come to you in this moment, and we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, God, that you, have, that you will speak to us through your, word, through your word. You encourage us through your Holy Spirit. God, I pray right now that you would uh, restore our minds and our hearts. Help us, God, to continue, Lord, to turn to you every single day. God, we ask, God, that your word, as it is spoken, and, in, and, and I ask, God, that you would uh, just use me as a vessel, God, to, uh, to speak your word clearly. I pray, God, that you would open up our hearts and our minds, God. Help us, God, to lean in with expectation, God, that you will give us a word that will encourage us for the rest of the year. God, we love you. We give you all the honor and the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, so true story. I had planned on preaching something else, but what we do at, a, at our uh, one of our things that we do as a tradition with our families, we do open up gifts and we have Santa Claus and things. But uh, something we do is we always uh, will sit it and have breakfast and we'll read the the story of Christmas. And when we were reading the story of Christmas, man, the Holy Spirit began to move at our at our dinner at our uh, breakfast table. We were sitting there, just all of our family was around. We started reading the story of uh, of the of Christmas, and the Holy Spirit started moving. My wife started crying. My my mother in law started crying. Then they got me to cry, and I'm not a very emotional person, but. That was when I knew that this was what the Lord wanted me to, to share. So as we get ready to dive into this scripture, I want, the first point I want to give you is that anything worth having is worth waiting for. Anything worth having is worth waiting for. I'll say it one more time. Anything worth having is worth waiting for. Verse 25 says, at that time there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and what? Eagerly waiting. He was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. So that tells us that he would spend time in the temple and he was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to be, to be brought into the temple and he was waiting for this, for this person named Jesus that he would, because he knew the scriptures, didn't he? He had read about the prophecies of Jesus. He had read about the prophecies of the Messiah. He, he had read about this person. He had read about this Messiah who would be delivered into the world, who would rescue Israel, who would rescue God's people. And he had, he had read about it. He knew what God was going to do. So when he was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to, to come, so sometimes in the waiting that is in the, in the waiting in our lives, man, that's some of the hardest, hardest seasons that we will walk through. In the waiting, sometimes we want God to do something right now, don't we? 
We don't want to wait for it. We don't want to, we don't want to sit back and, and wait for God to do something in our life. We want, to, we want this season that we are going through to end right now. As a matter of fact, God was reminding me of this thing called Alexa. How many of you guys, some of you guys have that, man. When you, as soon as you talk to Alexa, she says, she, she'll give you an answer right then. And so you're like, all right, man, I'm, I'm good. I'm good to go. Or uh, we're, living in a, we're living in a culture now where, man, everything happens right now. Like we don't have to wait on anything. I mean, you can order things online and have it delivered to your doorstep. You can actually, if you wanted to, you could order a pizza with your phone and have it delivered to your car when you get out of service. How crazy is that? I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. So we're, we're living in a culture where we're not, we're not taught how to wait on anything. And so the waiting can, can sometimes be the hardest moments in our lives, the hardest seasons. It's in the waiting that we become impatient. It is in the waiting that we, that, that we become a person who is irritable and hard to get along with. It is in the waiting that we lose sight of the promises that God gives us through his scripture. It is in the waiting that we lose hope. It is in the waiting, man, we're waiting for God to restore our marriage. We're waiting for God to, to break some addictions. We're waiting for God to do something, man, and, and, and God isn't, isn't doing it for whatever reason, and we're getting upset. I've seen people who get, man, we get discouraged when we begin to wait on God, and we get, we get, dis- we get discouraged in the seasons when we are waiting on God to do something. It is in the waiting that we begin to worry. We begin to worry, God, are you going to do this for me? God, are you going to restore my marriage? God, are you going to provide a job? God, are you going are you gonna to seal me? Are you going to heal me of this sickness? God, are you going to restore my broken relationships? God, are you going to are you going to bring my child back to you? It's in the waiting that we begin to worry. We begin to worry, God, are you going to God, are, are you really, are you still capable of doing what your scripture shows? Are you, you, you begin to worry, you begin to, you begin to have all these feelings. So you, we get to get discouraged and we begin to, uh, to do everything. We begin to, get, to just worry. And I mean, I see, I see so many people that worry, man. We, we worry, God, are you going to provide? God, are you going to, are you going to do what you say you're going to do? God, are you going to, and we, in, in the waiting, we begin to worry. So if you're waiting and waiting for, maybe you're here today and you're waiting for God to, to provide you with a child. Like you've been praying, God, I want to, I want to be a mom, I want to be a dad, and for whatever reason, it's not happening. And you know, I wish I could explain all those things and, and explain it away, but I can't. Like that's God, that's God's time, that's God's plan. And you're and you're waiting for God to give you something, but He hasn't given it to you yet. And if you are single, you're saying, Man, I'm single, and everyone around me is getting married. And everyone around me is starting a relationship. And you're watching all this take place. And then in the waiting can be some of the toughest moments and seasons of your life. So if you are graduating from college, you're like, man, I wanna, I'm, I'm ready to start my career. I'm ready to start my business. I'm ready to start my new job. And you can't even find a job right now. And you can't walk into, you can't walk right in from the from the graduation line and getting your uh, your diploma. You can't walk right into a job right, and you, and you can't figure out what what God's doing. Or if you're waiting on the results from a from an application that you put in, or you're waiting for, uh, you may be waiting today, and you're waiting for the results from a test that was ran last week. And in the waiting can be some of the toughest seasons of our life. But one thing that I feel like that God told me to tell you today is wait on it. Wait on it. Wait on it. Wait on whatever it is that God is wanting you, you feel like God is leading you into. What, wait on whatever it is that, that you want, that you're desiring. What, wait on whatever it is that you, are, that you are anticipating. Wait on whatever it is, because if you can't wait on it, Remember, remember, anything worth waiting for, anything worth having is worth waiting for. And God may be drawing you through a season. He may be bringing you through a season saying, you know what? Wait on whatever it is because when you get it, it's going to be worth it. Amen? So when we begin to wait on it, maybe God's, maybe God's saying, you know what? You're going to have to walk through the flood and you're going to have to walk through the fire. You're going to have to walk, walk through all these things in order to get the blessing that I have for you. But sometimes we're not willing to wait on it, are we? We want to take everything into our own hands. We want to do it on our own time. We want to do it on, in our own strength. And I'm not saying that you should sit back and, and just let God do what only God can do. You know what? I feel like that every single one of us have a part in it too. We have to do what we can and allow God to do what we can't. We have to do what we can and allow God to do what only God can do. We cannot 
take God and fit him into our plans. We have to put God, we have to put ourselves into his plans. Amen? We cannot take God and fit him into our plans. We must fit into God's plans. Verse 29 says, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace. So we know that he was eagerly waiting for this Messiah. And now that he had seen him, this is what he is saying. He says, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace. As you have promised, I've seen your salvation, which you have prepared for who? All people. You have prepared for all people. That's that's good. For all people. That means for for the for the yellow, the 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 it's it's for the it's for the Chinese, the Japanese, the black, the white, the Asian, the African, the American, the South American. It's for every single person. All people. It's mind blowing. It's for all people. He is the light to reveal God to the nations. Isn't that good how that, how that Simeon prophesied about Jesus that was alive now? He's, he's prophesying about Jesus saying that he would be the light to, that would reveal God to all nations. Did you know that Jesus was the greatest revelation of God that we could ever experience or ever see or ever read about? Jesus was the greatest revelation, and and that is why that we can come to faith in Christ and and that we could be made right with God through him. And Jesus even said that I am the light of the world, and those who come to me will find what? They will find life. I am the light. So it's it's so good to see how that that Simeon prophesied about it. There was people in the Old Testament that prophesied about about a, a light that would come into a dark world. And then you see how that Jesus even prophesied about it himself, that he was the light of the world. That he would walk into the darkest places and he would save people from their sin. It says, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Verse 33 says, Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them. This was something that the Jewish people would do. They would, they would, they would, there would be a blessing of prayer that would be over, uh, over the family after the dedication of their child. So he's blessing them and he says, uh, he says this, he says, And he said to Mary, the the baby's mother, this is his final words. This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. Psalm 118, 22 says, the stone that the builders rejected has, has now become the cornerstone. Isaiah 28, 16 says, it is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Amen. The name of Jesus is safe to build on. This cornerstone that I'm telling you is safe to build on. Whoever believes need never be shaken. So that, that, that tells us that, men, no matter what we are going through in our life, no matter what we, are, what, we are, what we are doing, what we are going through, whatever season that we may be in, that we can build our life on the name of Jesus, and we can know that, our, that we will never be shaken, no matter what the world brings against us, no matter what culture brings against us, no matter what happens in our life, men, that we can build our family, we can build our faith, we can build our relationship with, with, with each other, we can build our marriages, we can build our families on the faith of Christ, knowing that we will never Never be shaken no matter what disease or destruction or hard time comes upon us. But he was talking about how that they would be, he would be rejected. And we know that there were people that rejected Jesus, don't we? And maybe you're even here today and there's some things that you're going through in your life and you've even rejected Jesus. And you've turned him away and you've walked away from him. It says he has been a sign sent from God But many will oppose him. The people of Israel rejected Jesus because they were trying to be made right by keeping the law. And they didn't understand this Messiah. They had read about the Messiah, but they expected the Messiah to be born in a different way from a different genealogy of people. They thought that he would they thought that he would he would come in and and be this magnificent person who was this person that would be, you know, a, a king and he would have these all these crowns, and he would, you know, be this from a rich per, from a rich family, and he, you know, it, it just keeping. They were trying to keep. They were trying to be made right by keeping the law. And one thing that really just blew the people of Israel's mind is that there were people that were Gentiles that were being saved by simply putting their faith in Christ. 
They were being made right with God by simply putting their faith in Christ Jesus. They didn't have to follow a law or, or any kind of a legalistic form or, or go, go, go through all the, all the, the, the rituals and the, and the religious things that everybody would have to go through. All they had to do was put their faith in this man named Jesus, and they would be made right with God, and their sins would be forgiven forever. And that's why it tripped them up so much, and that's why they, were, they, they could not understand. That's why the Bible even prophesies how that there would be a, a cornerstone. There would be a stone, stone that people would trip over, and, they, and it would eventually be made the cornerstone. So sometimes we are like these people. We, are, we, we come to church on Sunday mornings, we come in with our smile on, we come in, we, we, give, a, we give our tithes when it's time to give an offering, and, and we, give to charitable, we give charitable gifts to other things and, 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 and different organizations in our community, and we come in and we serve in our kids' ministry, and, and when we come through, and, we, and we, 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 sometimes we become just like those people who were the Israelites. We, we begin to uh, try to do as much as we possibly can. As a matter of fact, I look at a world now today that does everything that they can possibly do to be made right to be made right and I want you to know something that there is no there is nothing that you can do to be made right and I'm not trying to discourage you giving gifts of uh, you know charitable gifts or, or tithing or serving in our church those things are important please don't misunderstand what I'm saying those things are very important but we should never allow our works to to, to establish our faith. Our faith establish our, establishes our works. That's what James says, right? If we are saved, then that's when we begin to serve. We don't serve so that we can be saved. We are made right with God by our faith, not by what we do or not by how that we live, right? We don't, we, don't, we don't try to live a righteous life. You cannot. The Bible says that we can't live a righteous life. No matter how hard that we try or how much effort that we put into it, there is no way that you can possibly live a righteous, righteous life. The only way that you are made right is by putting your faith in Christ. Verse 35 says, as a result... The deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. God's plan is never for you to try to be good enough. God's plan is never for you to try to be good enough to be accepted by him. It is for you to realize that you cannot be good enough and that you must depend on Christ. And I don't know what you're going through today, if you're going through a hard time or a tough season, but I know one thing, and that is that God is with you, and that God is good enough, and that he will restore your life and your family if you, turn to, if you just simply turn to him. Number two is wait with expectation. We are more concerned with impressing people than living for God. I look, I look around and I see that, you know, that this is how we're living. We are more obsessed with our life here on earth than we are with eternal life. We rationalize our sin, as a, a, we rationalize our, our sin and choose to live without truly fearing God. We believe in Jesus, but we rarely ever share our faith. The only time that we turn to God is when we really need something. We're not much different than the world. In Luke 2, 36, there was a, another prophet that was, in the, that was in the temple, and her name was Anna. Verse 36 says, Anna, a prophet, was also in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. We don't know how old she was uh, when her husband died, but uh, it, was, it was very well known that the Jewish culture, they would, married in, they would get married when they were in, in their teenage years. Uh, so she might have been 20-something years old when her, when her husband passed away. It says, then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. So she could approximately been in the temple for 80 years, or 60 years, sorry. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. Worshiping God with fasting and prayer. Sometimes we stop praying, or we stop reading our Bibles, or we stop coming to church, simply because things aren't going the way that we want them to go. Just simply because I've seen, I've heard people say, man, I'm mad at God. 
I'm mad at God because he's not answering my prayers. I'm I'm mad at God because he's not restoring my marriage. I'm mad at God because these things are happening. And, you know, I feel like that Anna could probably have been mad at God when her husband passed away at such a young young age, right? And at such a young time in in their marriage. But what what did she do? She devoted her time to prayer and fasting. And she was anticipating the Messiah. Maybe that's you. Maybe you, you're, you're, you're wanting a strong relationship with God, but you feel like that God's not answering your prayers. He's not, he's not, he's not you know, giving you the answers that you want. But I want you, I want you to know something. This is a word that I feel like that God is wanting me to give you, and that is God's delays are not God's denials. God's delays are not God's denials. Just because you're not getting the answer that you want does not mean that God is denying your prayer. It just might mean that God's, it's just not God's timing. So God's delays are not God's denial. She was doing all that she knew, and all that she knew was to draw close to the Lord. We do all that we can do, and we allow God to do what only he can do. My wife and I, before we ever got married, we prayed that we, would, we wanted to give our kids something that we weren't ever given, which was a life of faith. I was saved at 14. My, kids, my, my wife and my, my family did not take me to church. I was not raised in church. After 14, I made some very bad choices till I was about 21. And then by God's grace, I was redeemed. But I knew when I got married that I wanted to give my kids something that I, didn't, I was not raised in. And so we would pray for our children. We would pray, Lord, help us to learn how to raise our kids. Help us to teach our kids and to share their faith. So we, ever since then, we've always read the Bible to them um, Uh, It's been about four years ago. I had the privilege of leading both of my kids to Christ and uh, baptized both of them on Easter Sunday morning. Uh, But one of the most special moments was this past uh, Saturday, actually yesterday morning. I was in the hunting blind, hunting with my kids, and um, my son, he asked me, because a lot of times what I would do is while I'm hunting, I'll reach and grab my, my phone, and I'll read through my Bible as we're hunting. That's just something I do. I always have, even if I'm by myself. My son turned around and he looked at me and he said, hey, dad, can I read the daily scripture? And I said, yes, of course you can. So he reads the daily scripture and he, he says, dad, he said, that really helped me. Man, I want you to know that I could cry right now. Because my child is developing a faith that is not mine. But it is a faith that is his. And I believe in that moment yesterday morning when he read the scripture that the Holy Spirit gave him exactly what he needed through the scripture. And I I feel like that the Lord wants me to say this to you. I could not get off of this stage if you have not made a decision for Christ. I cannot get off this stage without telling you and begging you. This is the most important decision that you will ever make. He is real to me. He's changed my life, and he will change yours. And I want you to know that those were prayers that we prayed over 12 years ago, and I can sit back and watch them come true. We wrote scripture on the, we would write scripture over here in, the old, in our old auditorium, and we were praying for our kids before they were ever born. And I've never quit praying for my kids. But it's just so exciting to see happen. And, you know, I've, these are things that I have waited for. I've, I've, I've prayed long ago, and I've, and I've waited with anticipation, waiting for God to move, waiting for God to develop them. You know, I could have pushed those things and could have tried to force my kids to do things, but, man, I've always just tried to lead by example and tried to show them my faith. Have I messed up? Absolutely, I have. And you will, too. But by God's grace, we are given another chance. Not, not that we abuse his grace, but we try to live our life praying, just praying and expecting God to do what only God can do. Could I have done that on my own? Absolutely not. And neither can you. So what if 2019 was a different year? What if 2019 was something that you, you, you've been waiting for God to do something and God's telling you, wait on it, that whatever it is that you're waiting on is worth it? And you begin to wait with expectation. You begin to wait with expectation. Because in verse 38, this is what the scripture says. It says, she came, along, she came along just as Simon was talking with Mary and Joseph. And she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been doing what? 
Nobody else is paying attention, I guess. Waiting with what? Waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. Waiting expectantly. In 2019, what if we begin to expect God to restore our marriage? What if we begin to expect God to help you be the mom and the dad that you've always wanted to be? What if you begin to expect God to break your addictions and restore you back to who you once were? What if you begin to expect God to mend your relationships with the family that has been broken for so many years? What if you begin to expect God to restore the broken vessel of who you are? You're just a broken person. You've realized that today. That you're just a broken person. That you want God to take this broken person and begin to shine his light through the cracks of your life and begin to share your faith with other people. What if you begin to live a life that was no longer in fear, but it was in faith and expectation that God was going to do something amazing in your life. I like what St. Augustine wrote. It says, faith is to believe what we do not see. The reward of faith is to see what you believe. See, the world tells it that we should believe after we see. But faith is that we should believe before we see. So this year, let's begin to pray with expectation, expecting God to do what only he can do, knowing that whatever it is that we are waiting for is worth it, and wait with expectation. This is something that I had written in my journal that I'm going to share with you. What I owe to God, I cannot pay. What he has given me, I do not deserve. What he is doing is beyond my comprehension. The joy he gives me, the world cannot give. The help he extends is worth more than anyone can understand. He is my Savior, and his name is Jesus. So as we bow our heads and we close our eyes today, we're going to bring this service to a close. If you are here today and you say, you know what? God just revealed that I have been walking away from him all this time. And I've been trying to do everything on my own. I've been trying to. I've, I've applied so many different jobs. I've tried to restore my marriage. I've tried to restore broken relationships. I'm trying to break this addiction. I'm trying to do all these things. But you just now realize that you cannot do it on your own. So if you're here today and you say, you know what? And every single one of us have a choice. Every single person that is here under the sound of my voice, you have a choice to either make a decision for Christ and follow him or not. So if you're here today and you say, you know what, I'm, I'm ready to make that choice today. I'm making a decision for Christ. I'm saying yes to Jesus for the very first time. If that is you, the rest of the church is praying for you. We're excited about the decision that you're about to make. And we're here for you. We're family. So if you're ready to make that decision, up right now and say, man, that's me. I'm, ready. I'm making the decision for Christ today. Amen. I see your hand, sir. Awesome. Is there anybody else? You say, I'm making a decision for Christ today. I'm saying yes to Jesus. I've been saying no. I've been walking on my own. I'm ready to say yes to him and allow him to do what only he can do. Praise God. Is there anybody else? You say, man, that's me. Just shoot your hand up. Nobody else is looking. It's you and, you and God. Awesome. Okay, church. Nobody prays alone. We all pray together. Let's pray out loud. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for saving me. I put my faith in you. I trust you. I follow you. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me for where I have done wrong. 
I realize that I need you. I give you my life. My life is not my own. In Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. 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 Thank you.